Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one. Questions one to twelve. You will hear a doctor in a general practice surgery interviewing Jane Rogers, a patient with a problem that started recently. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Jane, good morning. It's good to meet you. I'm Dr. Jones. How do you do, Dr. Jones? Very well, thank you. Please have a seat. Thank you. Okay. Now, Jane, just before we begin, can I start by asking you your age?、Uh, I'm 25. Okay. And what brings you in today, Jane? What's the problem?、Um, well, I've been feeling a bit tired for the past few weeks, and I don't seem to have much energy to do anything really. And I was wondering if you could tell me what's wrong with me. Okay.、Um, well, tell me a little bit more about it.、Um, well, I started to get tired about four weeks ago, and it's really、yes. persisted since that time.、Um, and I've actually had to stop playing netball because I've, I've been so tired.、Um, when it started off, I had some aches and pains in my muscles, and、um, but they seem to have settled down now. And it's really just the, the tiredness that's persisting. And、um, I've got exams in a few weeks, and I'm really worried that I won't be able to study properly because I'm feeling so tired. I see. Goodness, that must be very distressing for you. Yeah, it's really worrying me. Yeah. What、uh, What are you studying? I'm a social work student. I see.、Um, at, at La Trobe University, and you know we've got our exams soon. Right. Okay. Well, we'd better we'd better get on and make you well then.、Mm. Well, tell me.、Um, apart from the aches and pains that you noticed initially with this illness, was there anything else in particular that you'd noticed?、Um, well, it sort of started quite suddenly, really. And, and when it started, I had a bit of a cold,、um, you know, a bit、yes. of a blocked-up head and a, a runny nose.、Um, and I actually went to the doctor at Student Health at the university,、yes. and he said I just had a virus and I didn't need any treatment and it would go away. Um, and he didn't do anything else than that, really. Right. Okay. So at the moment, just to let me clarify again, the main problem now is tiredness. All of the other symptoms have have settled down.、Um, yeah, just really tired, and I can't do anything really. Okay. Being a student and being particularly close to exams, I mean, are you under any sort of, you know, excess stress or pressure? Could that be contributing to the problem? Uh, well, I guess everyone gets worried about their exams, but I, I'm doing pretty well this year, so I think I'm going to pass if I、right. could get over this tiredness. Right. Okay.、Um, are you taking care of yourself? Are you eating well? Are you sleeping enough? Um, um, I have a pretty good diet. I eat three meals a day and eat meat and vegetables and all those sort of things. So I think my diet's pretty good.、Um, When I wake up in the morning, I'm still really tired, even though I've, I've slept well all night, and it's just really hard to get out of bed. Right. Okay. Has anyone else around you been ill like this?、Um, well, I share a flat with two girlfriends, and one of them、uh, went to the doctor last week, and the doctor said she had glandular fever. I see.、Mm, and, and she's been really tired too, and I was wondering if that might be my problem. Right. That's a particular concern of yours. Well, yes. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want glandular fever. That'd be terrible. Okay. Well, that's certainly a possibility that we might have to think about, actually.
but let me ask you a few more questions, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, your general health, what's that been like? Oh, I'm normally a pretty fit and well person. I haven't yeah. had any problems really. Good. And in the past, you've there have been no major problems with illness or? No, I've been fine. Great. Are you on any medications, Jane? No. Okay. And can I ask you a personal question? Certainly. Um, are you sexually active? Yes, I've, I've got a boyfriend that I've been seeing for about six months. Right. And it's a regular relationship? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, concerning aspects about safe sex? Oh, well, we use condoms um, and I'm sure he doesn't do anything and, I'm, you know, I've only got one partner so I don't think there's any problems like that. Right, okay. Is there any possibility that you may be pregnant despite the fact that you're using condoms? No, no, we haven't had any problems with the condoms and um, my last period was last week and that was fine. Right, and that was on time, normal, as expected. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Are your periods unusually heavy or um, or excessive, last long? No, I've had no troubles with them. They're regular. Um, they haven't changed at all. Okay, Jane. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. Um, in particular, do you smoke or drink? Um, no, I, I don't smoke. Um, I have a, um, on the weekends, I'd have about two or three light beers when I go out, but that's all. That's about it. Okay. And as far as your family goes, any major family history of illnesses or problems? Um, my dad's got a bit of high blood pressure. Mm. But he's an engineer and he works fairly hard, so it might be due to that, I guess. Um, and my mum, um, she's well. She works in an office and she's been fine. I've got a sister that's um, a lawyer and she hasn't had any health problems either. Right. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. Here, Dr. Brian Fleming interviewing a parent of a child presenting today. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Come in, Mr Murray. Oh, I see you've got Kate with you. Yes, that's right, Doctor. She's had an accident at school. Oh, dear. Well, I'll bring you both in here and get Kate comfortable on the couch first. Oh, good. I think she's in quite a bit of pain. Yes, obviously, and she's looking very pale. Now, can you tell me what happened? Well, she had a fall at school, actually. It was in her gymnastics class, and I don't know... I think she landed awkwardly in one of the practice exercises. And how long ago was that? Well, the school called me to pick her up and I came straight here, so about an hour ago, I think. All right. Now, before we go any further, how old is Kate? She's uh, seven and a half, Doctor. Is she on any medications at all? Well, she gets occasional asthma attacks, so she uses a Ventra inhaler uh, when necessary. Okay, and no other illnesses? No. Now, looking at Kate's right leg, she does have a nasty bruise developing as well as some swelling, so I do need to take an x-ray. Well, I've got the x-ray results here, and it's a spiral fracture of the right tibia. Oh, dear. I was hoping it would just be a sprain. No, it's more serious than that. I see. Now, I've rung the fracture clinic at the hospital, and they've advised that we can't put a cast on while there is that swelling. Right. But they've asked me to put on a back slab cast while there is that swelling and also a bandage to keep that in place. I see. Has she taken anything to relieve the pain yet? No, not yet. Well, I'll prescribe her a medication known as Pain Stop for Children. It's specifically formulated for fractures and and contains both paracetamol and codeine. Right. 
and it's in liquid form and fast acting. Oh, good. And how often should she take it, Doctor? For her age, uh, she can take 10 to 12 mil every six hours until the pain subsides. And how long do you think that will take? Within 48 hours. But I do want you to contact me if pain persists longer than this. Will do, Doctor. And the other thing is plenty of rest for the next few days. Now, we'll need to set Kate up with some crutches, and you can get them from the pharmacy across the road. Okay. Now, they'll make sure that they're fitted and adjusted to her height. Okay, but she's only seven, and I wonder how she'll manage. Well, you'll receive instructions from the pharmacist. Okay, she'll definitely need that. And they can also provide a DVD, which explains how to use the crutches properly, including how to get up and down stairs. This will help her gain confidence. Now look at question four. Take notes on the first 48 hours. Now, Doctor, I'm, I'm worried about what I can expect now. You know, I mean, if she had another fall or knocked her leg... Yeah, you're right. It, it's not fully protected at this stage until she gets the full plaster cast, so both you and Kate will need to take care. I see. And during the first 48 hours, you need to keep the leg elevated in order to reduce the swelling. Right. And encourage her to wriggle or move her toes as much as possible. This will help reduce any swelling. Okay, I and think I can do that. Well, at night, when she goes to bed, put a pillow under her leg so that it remains elevated. And is there anything else I need to be aware of? Well, if she complains of tingling feeling, you know, like pins and needles, that means the leg needs to be elevated. Hmm. And if she's in pain or can't be settled by the analgesics, then you need to give me a call. Okay. And finally, watch out for any numbness or loss of feeling. Will she be able to shower with the cast on? Well, it's important not to wet the cast at all. She can have a shower, but the cast will need to be wrapped in a waterproof bag and sealed. I see. And keep the cast away from direct heat, such as heaters, electric blankets and so on. Right. And make sure she doesn't put any weight on her leg or the cast in the early stages. Will it feel uncomfortable? It may feel itchy, but she shouldn't scratch under the cast as this can lead to skin irritations. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, Choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. A Health Minute with Dr Norman Swan. Now read the question. I assume that given the choice, you'd rather age with your marbles intact, and there is evidence that lifestyle matters. But what about specifics like physical activity and diet, particularly the Mediterranean diet, which is typified by a low proportion of land animal protein, lots of plant-based foods, olive oil as a source of fat, and a little wine. Two recent studies of people in their mid to late 70s help a little. One study followed people in New York for over five years looking at the incidence of Alzheimer's disease and found that exercise, particularly more vigorous exercise, reduced the risk of Alzheimer's, as did closely adhering to a Mediterranean dietary pattern. About one in five people with the lowest level of exercise and diet adherence developed Alzheimer's compared to about one in eight who were goody two-shoes, and that was after allowing for other differences between the groups. The second study in France looked at decline in thinking ability in the Mediterranean diet and found a weaker link and no effect on the risk of dementia. It may be that in France the average person eats more of a Mediterranean diet than Americans to start with, making differences hard to find.
Question 26. Dr Claire Ashton James is a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney and works at the Pain Management and Research Institute at Sydney's Royal North Shore Hospital. Now read the question. The important thing to realise about pain is that it's a subjective experience based on three main components. There's somatic input, so the feelings of aversive sensations. There's an evaluation of those sensations, so how harmful or threatening are these sensations, which is subjective. And then there's also the emotional component, so how distressed am I in response to these aversive sensations. And the social context you're in when you experience pain has directly influences your evaluation of how harmful the sensation is, how potentially threatening it is to be in pain, uh, to be injured in that situation, and very closely related to that is the amount of distress you feel in response to that aversive sensation. So what are the implications for how we can better manage people who are in pain? My research focuses on healthcare professionals and their role in patients' pain experience. Question 27. Dr Charlene Wong, a paediatrician and health policy researcher at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Now read the question. And the study is to collect deep health data in a cohort of at least 10,000 people in the U.S. in an effort to map human health and health transitions. And they know that they're being mapped? They do. They are agreeing to be part of the study. Uh, many of them are, have joined the study because they're actually very excited and altruistic in wanting to help map human health. So this is what technically would be called a cohort study. Uh, That's where, correct. Where you, it's a longitudinal gather, cohort study. So you're gathering a group of people together and you're following them through to see what happens to them. Um, why is Google involved? Uh, are they picking up data from their behavior online to assist you or, is it, or are they just, use, you're just using Google to uh, recruit? Sort of all of the above, I would say. Um, we are collecting a broad range of different types of data from imaging studies to blood tests and urine tests and even tests on the stool um, to look at all the different molecular markers that are available currently. We are also eventually going to be looking at other types of data, including data from people's medical records, data from what they are doing online. This study is still evolving to determine what all the data points that we might be collecting will end up being. Question 28. Dr Jules Montague is a neurologist from Dublin and author of Lost and Found, Memory, Identity and Who We Become When We're No Longer Ourselves. Now read the question. Sure. So you would think that your most emotional memories would be the most accurate, but it transpires that's not the case. If you look at things like the Challenger disaster or 9-11 or Lockerbie, for example, uh, plenty of studies have been done in some of these scenarios where people will impart memories, for example, as you said, in 9-11. And there was a study that looked at downtown participants, so people who were really close to what happened and some who were further away. And those who were involved and closer to the action of what happened that day actually had lots of memories to impart and they were very vivid, but not necessarily more accurate. So they were able to fill in lots of information, but it wasn't necessarily accurate. We think that's because the way our memory works 
depends on how much emotion is in a situation. So if you're personally remembering something very emotional right now, the hippocampus, of course, is, is kicking in. That does memory. But so is the amygdala, which is all about emotional memories. And that means your memories certainly are more vivid, but it doesn't mean that they're more accurate. And again, it's not that you're lying in any way. It's that the circuitry in your brain for evolutionary purposes has decided to kick in in a slightly different way. Question 29. Dr. Diana Adams, a medical oncologist at MacArthur Cancer Therapy Centre and the co-founder of Avexia Care. Now read the question. In all cancer types, there is a benefit to exercise. We now know that exercise can actually mitigate some of the side effects of therapy and can actually improve the quality of life for those patients both during and after therapy. In addition, it is possible for some cancers it may actually improve their chances of the cancer not returning. So we know that exercise can actually improve the patient's fatigue through therapy it's likely to actually improve the chance of them completing their therapy. So the medicines we give to treat cancer can increase the chance of side effects and fatigue, and exercise can ameliorate these side effects. We know that it is safe. It's been proven in clinical trials with actually quite significant volumes and intensities of exercise. A classic example would be prostate cancer, where we suppress testosterone. And we know that testosterone is important for muscle mass. So by using exercise, we can counteract some of the effects of that muscle loss through a tailored program. Question 30. Professor Lynn Fritzke is a cancer epidemiologist at Curtin University in Perth and chaired the subcommittee at the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which concluded just how carcinogenic Roundup and his stable mates are. Now read the question. I mean, is the IARC going to change its mind now? Um, I don't think there's enough evidence to change the mind yet. I mean, a possible carcinogen is, is still the case. There are There is very strong mechanistic evidence that that glyphosate can damage cells in, in, uh, and damage DNA in um, animals and possibly in humans as well. Um, and so there is, you know, some evidence that it it may be carcinogenic. So I think just having that other one big study doesn't necessarily negate the whole decision. So where does that leave us with uh, glyphosate for casual use or occupational use? Should it be banned? I think, I think that might be going a little bit far at the moment with the evidence we have. My personal opinion is that we should minimise it as much as possible. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Maya Angelou couldn't escape the nagging doubt that she hadn't really earned her accomplishments. Albert Einstein experienced something similar. He described himself as an involuntary swindler whose work didn't deserve as much attention as it had received. Accomplishments at the level of Angelou's or Einstein's are rare, but their feeling of fraudulence is extremely common. Why can't so many of us shake feelings that we haven't earned our accomplishments or that our ideas and skills aren't worthy of others' attention? Psychologist Pauline Rose Clance was the first to study this unwarranted sense of insecurity. In her work as a therapist, she noticed many of her undergraduate patients shared a concern. Though they had high grades, they didn't believe they deserved their spots at the university. Some even believed their acceptance had been an admissions error. While Clance knew these fears were unfounded, she could also remember feeling the exact same way in graduate school. She and her patients experienced something that goes by a number of names, imposter phenomenon, imposter experience, and imposter syndrome. Together with colleague Suzanne Imes, Clance first studied imposterism in female college students and faculty. Their work established pervasive feelings of fraudulence in this group. Since that first study, the same thing has been established across gender, race, age, and a huge range of occupations, though it may be more prevalent and disproportionately affect the experiences of underrepresented or disadvantaged groups. To call it a syndrome is to downplay how universal it is. It's not a disease or an abnormality, and it isn't necessarily tied to depression, anxiety, or self-esteem. Where do these feelings of fraudulence come from? People who are highly skilled or accomplished tend to think others are just as skilled. This can spiral into feelings that they don't deserve accolades and opportunities over other people. And as Angelou and Einstein experienced, there's often no threshold of accomplishment that puts these feelings to rest. Feelings of imposterism aren't restricted to highly skilled individuals either. Everyone is susceptible to a phenomenon known as pluralistic ignorance, where we each doubt ourselves privately, but believe we're alone in thinking that way because no one else voices their doubts. Since it's tough to really know how hard our peers work, how difficult they find certain tasks, or how much they doubt themselves, there's no easy way to dismiss feelings that we're less capable than the people around us. Intense feelings of imposterism can prevent people from sharing their great ideas or applying for jobs and programs where they'd excel. At least so far, the most surefire way to combat imposter syndrome is to talk about it. Many people suffering from imposter syndrome are afraid that if they ask about their performance, their fears will be confirmed. And even when they receive positive feedback, it often fails to ease feelings of fraudulence. But on the other hand, hearing that an advisor or mentor has experienced feelings of imposterism can help relieve those feelings. The same goes for peers. Even simply finding out there's a term for these feelings can be an incredible relief. Once you're aware of the phenomenon, you can combat your own imposter syndrome by collecting and revisiting positive feedback. One scientist who kept blaming herself for problems in her lab started to document the causes every time something went wrong. Eventually, she realized most of the problems came from equipment failure and came to recognize her own competence. We may never be able to banish these feelings entirely, but we can have open conversations about academic or professional challenges. With increasing awareness of how common these experiences are, perhaps we can feel freer to be frank about our feelings and build confidence in some simple truths. You have talent. You are capable. Extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
In the mid-16th century, Italians were captivated by a type of male singer whose incredible range contained notes previously thought impossible for adult men. However, this gift came at a high price. To prevent their voices from breaking, these singers had been castrated before puberty, halting the hormonal processes that would deepen their voices. Known as castrati, their light angelic voices were renowned throughout Europe until the cruel procedure that created them was outlawed in the 1800s. Though stunting vocal growth can produce an extraordinary musical range, naturally developing voices are already capable of incredible variety, and as we age, our bodies undergo two major changes which explore that range. So how exactly does our voice box work, and what causes these shifts in speech? The specific sound of a speaking voice is the result of many anatomical variables, but it's mostly determined by the age and health of our vocal cords and the size of our larynxes. The larynx is a complex system of muscle and cartilage that supports and moves the vocal cords, or as they're more accurately known, the vocal folds. Strung between the thyroid and arytenoid cartilages, these two muscles form an elastic curtain that opens and shuts across the trachea, the tube that carries air through the throat. The folds are apart when we're breathing, but when we speak, they slam shut. Our lungs push air against the closed folds, blowing them open and vibrating the tissue to produce sound. Unlike the deliberate focus required for playing an external instrument, we effortlessly change notes as we speak. By pushing air faster or slower, we change the frequency and amplitude of these vibrations, which respectively translate to the pitch and volume of our voices. Rapid and small vibrations create high-pitched, quiet tones, while slow, large vibrations produce deep, bellowing rumbles. Finally, by moving the laryngeal muscles between the cartilages, we can stretch and contract those folds to intuitively play our internal instruments. This process is the same from your first words to your last, but as you age, your larynx ages too. During puberty, the first major shift starts as your voice begins to deepen. This happens when your larynx grows in size, elongating the vocal folds and opening up more room for them to vibrate. These longer folds have slower, larger vibrations, which result in a lower baseline pitch. This growth is especially dramatic in many males, whose high testosterone levels lead first to voice cracks and then to deeper, more booming voices and laryngeal protrusions, called Adam's apples. Another vocal development during puberty occurs when the homogeneous tissue covering the folds specializes into three distinct functional layers. A central muscle, a layer of stiff collagen wrapped in stretchy elastin fibers, and an outer layer of mucous membrane. These layers add nuance and depth to the voice, giving it a distinct timbre that sets it apart from its prepubescent tones. After puberty, most people's voices remain more or less the same for about 50 years. But we all use our voices differently. And eventually, uh -huh. we experience the symptoms associated with aging larynxes, known as presbyphonia. First, the collagen in our folds stiffens, and the surrounding elastin fibers atrophy and decay. This decreased flexibility increases the pitch of older voices. But for people who have experienced the hormonal effects of menopause, the higher pitch is countered and outweighed by swollen vocal folds. The fold's increased mass slows their vibrations, resulting in deeper voices. All these symptoms are further complicated by having fewer healthy laryngeal nerve endings, which reduces precise muscle control and causes breathy or rough voices. Ultimately, these anatomical changes are just a few of the factors that can affect your voice. But when kept in good condition, your voice box is a finely tuned instrument, capable of operatic arias, moody monologues,